Okay, so um, I want to start by just thanking Anton and Gauti for inviting me to be part of this very exciting workshop. I'm really thrilled to have this opportunity to describe our human neocortical neurosolver software to this very wide audience. And so I wanted to start by beginning with an overview of the challenge in human neuroscience that we're trying to address by the development of this new tool. And so we all know that MEG and EEG are incredibly powerful techniques to study human brain dynamics, but it's still very difficult to infer what's going on at the underlying cellular and circuit level. And to connect to the very rich details and data sets that we can now get in animal models. And it's critical to connect to this circuit level detail if we want to understand why these human signals correlate with function or to target treatments when they're disrupted. And so our software is designed to bridge these scales. And it's a neural modeling software developed to bridge these scales. And in fact, there are two types of modeling that we need in order to get from these extracranially measured signals to the intracranial circuits. The first type of modeling is called current source estimation modeling or inverse modeling. And this links the extracranially measured sensor data to the underlying location and time course of these big electrical currents that create these signals. From there, we need to connect these electrical currents to the cellular and circuit microscale activity. And this is the perfect job for computational neural modeling where we can have specificity both at this microcircuit level and at this macro scale recording level. And this type of modeling is the foundation of our human neocortical neural solver. And what I'm going to be describing to you is how we've turned this modeling framework into a user-friendly software tool for the community to be able to start to develop and test predictions on the neural origin of their human MEG or EEG data. So I'm going to begin by describing some of the background on the development of this new tool. And then I'm going to walk through an application focusing on studies in my lab where we've been using this framework to study the neural mechanisms involved in tactile perception. And in the end, I'll briefly touch on some other HNN applications. So how do we begin to develop a model that can connect what we're recording outside of the head to what's going on at this microcircuit level? Well, as I've mentioned, the first step is that we need to apply inverse solution methods to estimate the location, the direction, and the time course of these big electrical currents in the brain that we call primary currents that create this recorded sensor data. And from there, we need to think about, well, how are these big primary currents generated inside the brain? And we know that these primary currents are coming from the postsynaptic intracellular current flow in these long and spatially aligned cortical pyramidal neuron dendrites. Essentially, the length of these in their aligned orientation creates a net sump current that's very large and records an electric creates an electric and a magnetic field that can be recorded outside of the head with our sensors. So given that this is where the signal comes from, there are some key features, canonical features of neocortical circuitry that we need to take into consideration in our models if we want to develop a model to study the circuit level generators of these macro scale signals. And the first is that the, the cortex is a layered structure. We have various types of excitatory and inhibitory neurons that are synaptically coupled, including pyramidal neurons with these long apical dendrites in the supergranular infragranular layers. These networks don't sit in isolation, but they're constantly receiving input from other parts of the brain. And there's two primary pathways of input into the cortex. The first pathway comes from the lemniscal thalamus. This is the pathway that relays sensory information from the periphery up to the granular layers and then to the other cortical layers. The other pathway comes right into the supergranular layers and it relays information from higher order cortex or from non lemniscal thalamic nuclei that project right up to the supergranular layers. And these exogenous inputs they're excitatory and they synapse to both the excitatory and inhibitory neurons in the local cortical circuit. And then again, the primary current dipole signal that we measure with our MEG and EEG is calculated by summing up 
the net intracellular current flow in these pyramidal neuron dendrites across the whole population. And importantly, with this construction in the model, the units of measure that come out are current times distance, nanoampere meters. This is the same unit of measure that we get from our source localized data. And so we have one-to-one -one comparison between the output of our model and our source localized data, which makes a very powerful tool for developing predictions about how these signals are generated. Now, <clears throat> one of the biggest challenges, probably the biggest challenge in computational neuroscience is deciding what's the right scale of model to develop to answer the question that we're interested in. And what I'm showing you here is clearly a reduced representation of the full complexity of the neurons in the neocortical circuit. But what we believe is that when you record at the macro scale, you don't have access to all of the finer details of the neocortical circuitry, but nonetheless, you can say something meaningful about the origin of the signal from these canonical features and input pathways. And so next, I want to just briefly give you a little bit more detail of the model. The model is simulated using neuron Python. We have multi-compartment pyramidal neurons with these long extended dendrites. They're synaptically coupled to inhibitory neurons that are modeled as point neurons. And we have both fast and slow GABAergic and glutamatergic synapses connecting these neurons. We simulate the electrical activity of each compartment of every cell using Hodgkin-Huxley dynamics. We have active ionic conductances in both the somatic and the dendritic compartments of these cells, and they've been tuned to reproduce realistic spiking patterns to injected current. We calculate the intracellular current flow from cable theory. And then again, the net primary current dipole signal that comes out of this model is taken by summing up the intracellular current flow across the pyramidal neuron populations. And importantly, we have these input pathways through which we drive the network. Now, we're not simulating all of these other driving networks, but rather we create trains of action potentials in predefined patterns that activate the local network through these fee forward and feedback pathways, which we also refer to as proximal drive or distal drive because of where they effectively hit the pyramidal neurons. The feed forward input effectively hits the proximal, dendrites of these pyramidal neurons and the distal drive hits the distal dendrites. And so, for example, if we wanted to simulate information that comes in through the thalamus, we can simulate a train of action potentials. These action potentials will activate excitatory synapse and can drive current flow up the dendrites to create a positive deflecting signal. Feedback input to these distal dendrites will activate synapses and drive current flow down the pyramidal neuron dendrites to create this negative deflecting signal. And it's a combination of this feed forward and feedback drive that creates the net activity that we get out of this network. Now what I'm showing you here is a schematic representation, reduced representation of the network. The full network contains a scalable number of pyramidal neurons in the supergranular and infragranular layers, and it represents a patch of cortex in the brain. And we've been specifically designing our software to study some of the most commonly measured MEG and EEG signals. When you measure outside of the head, you don't see a lot of variation, but you tend to look at things like ERPs, event-related potentials, or low frequency brain rhythms, rhythms in the alpha, beta, and gamma band. And so we're specifically designing the software to be able to study those signals from a single source localized region of interest. Now this is a really complicated large scale network model. The code is open source and it's available on GitHub. But as anybody who builds neural models knows, this code is very complicated to work with, even with the best of documentation. And so one of the things we've been working really hard to do is to make this model accessible to the broad MEG and EEG user community. And to do that, we've embedded the software in a user-friendly graphical user interface. We have a website where we're giving background information, installation instructions, tutorials. We give example data sets and parameter sets to start with. And importantly, we're designing this software to teach the community how to study the origin of the signals they're interested in. And that 
focuses on ERPs, alpha rhythms, beta rhythms, and gamma rhythms. And so when you start HNN, this is the graphical user interface that you see. And any simulation experiment is going to consist of driving this network with some kind of input through these feed forward and feedback pathways that depend on your experimental conditions and what you're trying to simulate. And so next, I'm going to walk you through an example of how to use this software, focusing on these studies from my lab, we've been looking at the neural mechanisms involved in tactile perception. So in my lab, we perform these tactile detection experiments where we give the subject, and I'm sorry, it seems like um, the graphics are a little off here. I don't know if it's the same for you guys, but it's a little bit scratchy. But anyway, this is um, a picture of the brain. And so we give these brief taps to the finger. We record the brain activity with either MEG or EEG. And then we apply these inverse solution techniques to isolate the contribution of the signal to the hand area of S1. And so what this picture is supposed to show is a picture of a brain in a region of interest in the hand area of S1. And what I'm showing you in our graphical user interface is the evoked response from that tap to the finger. And there's very reliable and reproducible peaks that emerge from that tap. And so the first thing that we wanted to do with this model is try to use it to understand, well, what is the neural origin of this ERP? How is it created in the underlying network? And so the first thing we did is we went to the literature. And there's a huge literature on the origin of ERPs, particularly in the somatosensory cortex. And what that literature suggests is that the S1 evoked response is generated by a sequence of activation to the local cortical circuit that consists of feed forward input from the thalamus that arrives at approximately 25 milliseconds, followed by feedback input at approximately 70 milliseconds, followed by a later re-emergent feed forward input approximately 100 milliseconds later at 125 milliseconds. So we wanted to use our model to test the hypothesis that this sequence of activation could reproduce this ERP and our current dipole signal. And so to do that, we can go into our model. We hit this, we click this set parameters button and a dialog box opens that allows us to change the parameters in the network, including what we've called here evoked input parameters. And so these evoked input parameters are gonna set the input spikes to our network. I'm gonna load in a predefined pattern of activity. And this is a parameter set that's provided with our software. And what you see now at the top is this histogram of the driving input. And so we have this pattern of feed forward proximal drive, feedback distal drive, and re-emergent feed forward proximal drive. And now when I hit run simulation, these inputs are gonna activate the network and the output is gonna be this net current dipole signal. And so I'm gonna hit run simulation and I get the output of my model. And you can see that this pattern can very nicely reproduce the signatures of this ERP. Now, importantly, this pattern was guided by the literature, but we spent a lot of time tuning the timing and the strength of these inputs in order to get a mass, nice match to the data. And we have some optimization tools within the software to help do that. But one of the main goals of the software is to connect this macro scale signal to the underlying circuit level activity. And so you can go in and you can view various features in the underlying circuit. I'm gonna show you a few of those here. And again, I'm not sure if you guys are seeing the same thing I am, but I'm having um, some difficulty with my graphics here. But in any case, the point I wanna make is, so we have our net current dipole. Simultaneously, you can look at here, we have different responses from the different layers. Over here, we have the somatic voltage traces from all the different cell types, color-coded by cell type. And we can look at the spiking raster plots of all the different cells in the network, again, color-coded by cell type. Now, this visualization is really important because it provides several benchmarks by which we can go in and further test the predictions coming out of the model with invasive recordings in animals or with other imaging modalities. And so I've been focusing on our experiments in the somatosensory cortex, but because HNN, HNN's model is based on canonical features of neocortical circuitry, 
it can be used to study signals in other brain areas. And so what I'm showing you here is a brief evoked response, not just from somatosensory cortex, but also from auditory and visual cortex. This was from a brief presentation of a letter. Um, and this is from the brief flash of this checkerboard stimulation. And you can see that there's some differences in these evoked responses, but there's some striking similarities in that they all start by going up and then coming down and then going up again. And what we can show with HNN is that the same pattern of input, this feed forward, feedback, feed forward input, can reproduce the ERPs in each of these primary sensory areas. And again, we've tuned the timing and the strength of these drives in order to get a good match to our signal. But this consistency, the consistency in the mechanism suggests that these macro scale observables are constrained by these common features of the canonical structure and the commonality in the input patterns to the neocortex. Okay, so now from here, we can use HNN to start to investigate the neural origin of changes in the ERP across different experimental conditions. And again, in my lab, we've been looking at tactile detection. And what I'm gonna focus on next is that we've observed that the ongoing state of the brain before you tap the finger will impact this evoked response and will impact whether the subject feels the tap to that finger or not. And we can use our modeling software to help us understand why, what is going on inside the brain to create that phenomenon. And so what I'm showing you now is, this was the image that I hoped that you saw earlier. Um, this is our source localized signal from the hand area of S1. This is the spontaneous single be signal before we tap the finger. And you can see there's this large amplitude oscillation. When you put a frequency filter on it, it has a very strong component in the beta band. Now the fluctuation changes at any point in time. And so what, one of the questions we were interested in is does the level of beta power in this pre-stimulus period before the tap comes in influence your ability to feel that tap to the finger? And the answer to that is yes. And so if we average the activity in this pre-stimulus period and we sort from trials that have low pre-stimulus power to those that have high pre-stimulus power, and we look at the detection rate as a percent change in hit rate from the mean, we see that on trials with higher pre-stimulus power, the subject is less likely to feel that tap to the finger. Correspondingly, if we look at the evoked response after the tap, and we sort it in trials where we had high or low power, we see that with high power, we get a lower amplitude response. And this response is very similar to the response if we sort over non-detected trials. And when, so we seem to have a direct causal relationship between the pre-stimulus rhythm and the impact on the evoked response in perception. And so the main question we were interested in is can HNN help us understand why? What is it about the mechanisms that create this beta rhythm that cause it to have an inhibitory effect on that tactile stimulation? And so to study this now, we have to use our model to study, well, how are these beta rhythms generated? And the first thing we had to do was take a closer look at our data. And so what I'm showing you here is an averaged response. This is averaged across 100 spectrograms that are one and a half seconds long. But the brain is an averaging when we tap the finger. And so what we did is we looked at the single trial activity without averaging. And we found that these beta rhythms emerge as these high power transient events. They typically last around 150 milliseconds. Excuse me, Stephanie. Oh, yes. You. Okay, thank you. Um, and this, this transient nature of beta is actually a very robust phenomena. It's reported now widely in the literature. It's been observed in somatosensory cortex motor cortex, frontal cortex, subcortical structures. It's conserved across species and recording modalities. It's a very robust phenomenon. We looked a little bit closer at the shape of the waveform that creates this phenomena. And you can see that there's this very stereotypical waveform shape that is defined, sorry, I've lost my pointer, here it is. Um, that's defined by this prominent negative deflecting peak that lasts 50 milliseconds. And so this is not a sinusoid oscillation. In its event that has 
a peak that lasts 50 milliseconds. When you put a frequency filter on this, you get high power in the beta band. And so now we have something that we can go into H imply HNN. Sorry, I'm losing my, uh, my pointer here. Um, and we can use our model to understand how is this waveform shape generated? And so due to time constraints, I don't have the time to give you all of the details how we arrived at this mechanism, but I'm just going to give you the punchline in that through a lot of trial and error, by matching the output of the model to this waveform shape, the model predicted that these beta events emerge from the simultaneous integration of two inputs to the cortex, a proximal drive that's broad and a distal drive that's strong in the last 50 milliseconds. And so I'm going to unpack down here how that input pattern creates this response. And so here's a histogram of the proximal drive. And if I simulate that to hit the network, it's going to push current flow up the dendrites. And if I only had the proximal drive, I'd get to this one prominent peak. But at the same time, I have this distal drive. It's going to push current flow down the dendrites. And it's going to be strong, and it's going to last 50 milliseconds, one beta period. And with this input, I can very nicely reproduce the shape that I see in my data. And so this prediction in the model very nicely reproduced our MEG data. It looks very similar in EEG data and some other data sets that we have. Again, it's a very robust phenomena. But the real test of the model predictions comes from recording inside of the brain. And we've been fortunate to be able to collaborate with groups studying somatosensory cortex with laminar recordings. Um, and in our 2016 paper, we have some evidence validating these model predictions in both mice and monkeys. Okay, so now we have a mechanism that creates these beta oscillations. I've already described the mechanism for a tactile evoked response. And so now the question is, can the model help us understand why it is that when we have this beta in the pre-stimulus period, we get this decreased evoked response, and that decreased evoked response corresponds to, I didn't feel the tap to the finger. And so we're going to take our model, we're going to simulate a beta event, we're going to simulate the tap to the finger, and we're going to see, can the model reproduce this result that we see in our data, and can it help us understand this phenomenon of non-detection with high power? And the answer is yes. And so here's the model output, where we simulate an evoked response either with or without a beta event. And you can see that the model very nicely reproduces this main difference that we see in our data. And one of the things that I really like to stop and point out here is that we actually did this in the model first. We had this prediction about beta. We had this prediction about the ERP. We put them together, and this is what the model predicted that we would see. And then we went back and looked at the data, and we remarkably we found it. And I think this is a really nice example of how a model can be generative of new and interesting predictions. And so now the real interesting question of, well, what's going on? Why is it that beta is causing this difference in the evoked response? And why does that mean that the subject says, I don't feel the tap to the finger? Well, looking a little bit more deeply into the model, it's telling us the following. And I'm just going to give you an overview of the results. Remember that beta is created by this strong distal drive. This distal drive is recruiting a lot of inhibition in the supergranular layers. When you have a lot of inhibition up here and you tap the finger, and then you have this feedback input that comes in to create this negative deflecting peak, it can't get in. And if it can't get in, then the neurons don't fire. And if the neurons don't fire, you get this decreased response out here. And these are the big pyramidal neurons that relay information out of the cortex. And so if you don't get firing in these big pyramidal neurons that are going to communicate with the rest of the brain, then you get a decrease in the upstream relay of information out of the primary somatosensory cortex. It doesn't get to the rest of the brain, and the subject says, no, I didn't feel to the tap of the finger. And so this is the prediction that the model is now making about why, when you have a lot of beta, you don't feel that tap. And we can look a little bit more closely in the model. Here I'm showing you the spiking activity of the different cells. When I simulate the evoked response with this sequence of drive with and without a pre seamless beta event. And what you can see is if I have a pre seamless beta event, I'm recruiting a lot of supergranular inhibition 
so that when the input finally arrives to the cortex, it's completely shunted and there's no firing. And the signal again, doesn't get out of S1. And the subject says, I didn't feel the tap to the finger. Now, at this point, these are just model predictions. We're making these predictions by getting a nice close agreement between the output of our model and our source localized human imaging data. But because we have all the microcircuit details, we can now go in with some very targeted predictions from the model to test to see if they're true with invasive recordings or other imaging modalities. So in the last minute, I just wanna briefly describe some other applications of HNN. Um, I've been focusing on our studies of beta rhythms, but we've also used the model to study the origin of alpha rhythms and gamma rhythms. We've used it to look at the impact of non-invasive brain stimulation on brain dynamics that can be measured with EEG. We've looked at changes in ERPs and rhythm with healthy aging. Other groups have used the model to look at changes in somatosensory rhythms in children with autism. This is a new software, but we have several ongoing studies. We're working with some groups to look at EEG changes with depression. We're looking at changes with development in the motor system. Um, and I'm gonna refer you to our website for a full list of our publications. And so that brings me to the end of the talk. Um, I've shown you that HNN's foundation is this neocortical column model under thalamocortical and cortical cortical drive that simulates the primary currents based on their biophysical origin. To make this accessible to a broad community, we've embedded it in this user-friendly graphical user interface. And we have a website where we're, we're trying to teach the community about these signals that they're looking at ERPs and low frequency brain rhythms. I've shown you an example where HNN combined with MEG and invasive recordings revealed this novel prediction on the mechanisms of these neocortical beta rhythms and is further predicting that beta is decreasing tactile detection via the recruitment of supergranular inhibition. And I hope that I've convinced you that HNN can be applied to uncover the circuit mechanisms underlying MEG and EEG correlates of both healthy and neuropathological states. And ultimately, we hope that it can help in the aid in the development of new treatment strategies. And so I want to thank my collaborators. I have a phenomenal lab, um, and they've all really contributed to this research in a meaningful way. HNN is being developed by a multi-institute team. There's several, 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 excuse me, of us at Brown University. Um, there's folks at the Martino Center at Yale University, now a few at the Nathan Klein in Columbia. Um, and so I thank you all for listening. And with that, I'll just leave you with my conclusions. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie, a great talk. So we have uh, time maybe for one or two quick questions. Um, so question from Via Sabbaratham. Uh, does the model explain why the first feedforward phase has two sub-phases in S1? Um, I think what they mean by sub-phases is two peaks. Is that what you mean? Probably. Uh, uh, okay, I, I'm going to, so let me go back. I, I probably should continue to share my screen. Um, so let me do that. Yes, two peaks. Uh, so I think what they're talking about is uh, oh this phenomena right here we have this up down up this is what I think they mean by two sub phases um, yes and the answer is what happens is this is mainly a layer two three phenomena and you get excitation followed by inhibition followed by some reemergent excitation from the from the local E to E connections. Um, and the way that you can dissect that that's what's happening is again, by going in and looking at the spiking activity of the individual neurons. And it can get very complicated um, and seem unintuitive sometimes as to why a signal goes up versus down in the pyramidal neuron dendrites, because it's this complicated interaction between the input from the other parts of the brain and also the inhibitory and excitatory connections either at those distal or proximal dendrites um, that are can ultimately controlling this information flow up and down the dendrites. But when you have inhibition at the soma, it can pull the current flow down the dendrites and that's what's happening in that case. And hopefully that answered the question. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Um, so 
we probably should be moving on, but thanks a lot for your great talk. Appreciate it.